Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Chris Stover, the Executive Director of the Canadian Center for Ethics in Public Affairs, which is co-founded by the Atlantic School of Theology at St. Mary's University. SACEPA has a mandate to provide an arena for critical thinking, public discussion, and research into current ethical challenges in society. What's right, what's wrong, and what's happening in the daily news is one of those very ethical challenges when we contemplate how credible access to information impacts our ability to participate in democracy. If you'd like to learn more about SACEPA, we have a, a table at the back that has all kinds of information and some DVDs that we've made in the past and you're really welcome to take those along with you. So SEPTA's approach is a collaborative one and we partner with a, a wide variety of groups and organizations to bring the program forward. And at this time I'd like to thank and recognize our program uh, support for this particular event which is Canada's Public Policy Forum and the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance at Dalhousie University. We're joined here tonight by the scholarly director of the McKechnie Institute, Kevin Quigley, who will also be moderating our question and answer period a little bit later in the program, and he'll also offer our closing and thanking remarks. And before I introduce our anticipated guest speaker tonight, I'd also like to welcome our live stream audience this evening, and also invite you to participate in the Q&A that we'll have following uh, the program. You can tune in through the chat portion and ask your questions and, and we'll bring those up to it. One of the things that we consistently hear on our evaluations, which you have in front of you, that I'm going to ask you to please fill out because the center finds those extremely useful, is that there are far too many top and introductory remarks. So I'm going to get right to a bio uh, about Edward Greenspawn, who is the President and CEO of Canada's Public Policy Forum. Ed has worked at the intersection of journalism, business and public policy for more than 30 years. He came to the forum from one of the world's largest news organizations, where he led global coverage of energy and the environment, and oversaw major journalistic undertakings. He joined Bloomberg in 2014 as editor-at-large for Canada, and has worked at Torstar Corp, publisher of the Toronto Star, as vice president of strategic investments. At the Globe and Mail, Greenspawn was a business reporter and editor, Ottawa Bureau Chief, European Correspondent, Founding Editor of GlobalMail.com, and Editor-in-Chief. He is the author of Double Vision, the inside story of the Liberals in Power, which won the 1996 Douglas Curtis Award for Best Public Policy Book, and Searching for Certainty Inside the New Canadian Mindset. In 2002, he won the Hyman Solomon Award for Excellence in Public Policy Journalism, in 2010, he chaired a 13-person panel for the Canadian International Council that produced a bold international policy strategy called Open Canada, a global positioning strategy for a network age. Ed has combined honors degree in journalism and political science from Carleton University and was a Commonwealth Scholar at the London School of Economics, earning a master's degree in politics and government. Please join me in welcoming Ed Greenspot. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Um, that was uh, delightful. I guess, you know, when you get older, it gets longer and longer, right? So that's one of the benefits of aging, apparently. Um, wonderful to be with you all uh, in Halifax tonight. Uh, uh, Halifax is... Um, a place close to my heart because I've been coming here for many years and uh, uh, I um, at graduate school befriended uh, uh, somebody from Cape Breton Island and therefore I now know uh, uh, so many people from Cape Breton and uh, Nova Scotia so I've been here for many years. Um, oops, I actually probably have to do something technical here. Hang on one second. Uh, there we go. Okay, better? I see, I see you cupped on your ear so I don't want you to have to do that all night. Okay. 
Um, but more, kind of more importantly, my family, when they came to Canada, uh, which seems a long time ago, because uh, it was 1929, uh, but they came here uh, uh, to Halifax, to Pier 21, and then they, because uh, uh, my grandfather, who had, and, and all my aunts and uncles were born outside the country, my mom is the only one born in Canada, and, uh, and uh, my grandfather had uh, TB, so they sent him to uh, Prince Edward Island. Now, I don't know what that says about, uh, about the feeling of Canadian immigration authorities in 1929 about PEI, but nonetheless, he went to uh, Prince Edward Island, Halifax first, and then worked on a fox farm um, uh, for six weeks or so until his father died, and they got a telegram from Russia saying his father died, and he had to go somewhere to um, pray with his people, um, not many of whom were in PEI, as it turned out. So, um, so he came to Halifax for a while, and then eventually they ended up uh, uh, in Montreal. So I think it's nice to be back in Halifax. He thought about going back to Russia, and that would have been a kind of pretty fatal mistake for uh, uh, all of us who, uh, who descended from that point, but my grandmother talked him out of it, which was good. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little about, uh, about journalism, about where the media is going, and, uh, and how that ties in uh, uh, with, uh, with democracy and the kind of amazing revolution we're going through in the media right now. Uh, now, uh, as, uh, as Chris uh, so kindly uh, uh, went into, I have a long and varied career in journalism, uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not working in journalism now. I left it about uh, six months ago to become uh, president of a think tank called the Public Policy Forum. But, you know, I used to say when, uh, when I was in journalism that um, there's those people who work in journalism and there's, there, and there's those people who are journalists. And, um, and I was one of the latter group. I was a journalist. I didn't work in journalism. And journalism is a way of looking at the world and thinking of the world like many other ways of looking and thinking of the world. So I'm, uh, I'm sort of stuck with it. I'll never, uh, I'll never be cured of it, and, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm happy of that. Um, nonetheless, I think it's brave and courageous to invite a journalist to, uh, to do this kind of presentation because um, uh, we're not always held in the highest esteem uh, by everybody, and uh, that seems inexplicable to those of us who are journalists rather than work in journalism, but it's true. And uh, I have a couple, there's a couple of quotes that I've always loved that, uh, that describe this. Um, you know, the great American writer Norman Mailer said, if a person is not talented enough to be a novelist, not smart enough to be a lawyer, and his or her hands are too shaky to perform operations, he or she will likely become a journalist. So uh, that's a, a, a real good call on the card, right? And then there was a famous quote, which is attributed to Winston Churchill. Like many Winston Churchill quotes, who really knows, right? But, uh, but it's so good, I, I, I don't want to be the one who does the deep dive on the research to find out, because uh, I think he caught journalism pretty well. He said, um, journalists do occasionally stumble over the truth. <laughs> but then they pick themselves up and carry on as if nothing had happened. <laughs> so, you know, now, uh, uh, it would be mean-spirited to say that both Norman Mailer and Winston Churchill were failed journalists who had to go into other lines of work afterwards, but, uh, but there might be some truth to that as well. Okay, so as I said, I want to talk about media and I want to talk about democracy. And uh, I just want to start with a question, if I would, and if you'd put up your hands, because we do have uh, uh, this sort of dichotomous world in some ways that's trying to find its identity between the old traditional um, forms of media and new digital forms of media. So I wonder, how many of you think the changes the news media's experience make for a better democracy? And how many of you think it makes for a worse democracy, okay? So better democracy. Okay, not a lot of hands on better democracy. There's a couple of people there who I came up late to be iconoclastic as much as anything. That's good. Okay. Um, worse democracy. Okay. So uh, I think we're pretty well done. That's good. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about uh, about those subjects and uh, and uh, what we're looking at at the Public Policy Forum uh, as we uh, as we do research on them. Uh, but first, I'm going to um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me uh, and my love of journalism uh, and where it comes from. I'm going to I hope speak to the so uh, societal importance of uh, of journalism and uh, then the threats it faces that are rooted, of course, in uh, technological change and the opportunities that have been presented as well. So um, let's start with uh, the self-indulgent part. Let's start with me. 
So I am, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, by the time I come around, and uh, uh, I'm um, uh, a Montrealer, I'm an Anglo-Montrealer, I'm a Jewish Anglo-Montrealer, I'm a Jewish Anglo-Montrealer, grew up in a house with people who had accents uh, that were um, uh, uh, sort of Russian and grandparents who lived in, uh, we lived in the same house and uh, who never uh, uh, really mastered uh, language. Um, so I, I, I see myself as a close to the immigrant experience. My, my kids find this the most ridiculous notion possible. They say, you are a charter member of the establishment. And I say, no, I'm not. But anyhow, uh, that's, uh, that's their, and they don't think that they are charter members of the establishment, which is an interesting uh, uh, view of it. I, I also happen to be a very, um, a small, little, tiny kid. At 13, I was four foot eight and weighed 65 pounds. Uh, so I was, uh, I was small. It didn't allow me to like play a lot of sports, or I did play a lot of sports. I just, uh, I didn't play them well, and I was pretty shy. So I was kind of made out to be a life observer, not a life participant, much more. And journalism turned out to be a perfect, uh, a perfect thing for me. Uh, I was also kind of crazy political junkie. And um, even from a young age, you know, I can remember um, skipping school uh, to uh, watch the, uh, at a, a pretty young age, to watch the Watergate hearings uh, on, on television. So, you know, I wish I had a better story about myself. I wish I skipped school to uh, um, do things that people should do when they skip school. But, uh, but I went home to watch uh, the Watergate hearings on TV. And I kind of fell in love with that whole Woodward and Bernstein idea. And uh, thus I moved from my plan to go into law uh, to, uh, to going into journalism, which turned out to be great because um, as a shy person, I, uh, I um, wasn't very good at talking to people, but suddenly I had license to ask any question I wanted of anybody as a journalist, which was good. And uh, Tom Wolfe, one of the great journalists of, uh, of his generation and who uh, the inventor of something that was called the new journalism, said that uh, any journalist who's not willing to ask people uh, things that are none of his or her business has no business being a journalist. So, you know, the license to ask quest impertinent questions is a pretty, uh, is a pretty good thing. Um, I um, started my, uh, oh, okay, so now I need to do this. This is, uh, this is uh, the uh, shy, um, uh, retiring uh, uh, teenage me uh, watching, well, not there watching the Watergate hearings, but that's kind of what it would have looked like. Um, so my first job, I worked in a small town called Lloyd Minster on the Saskatchewan, Alberta border. And, um, and there I experienced uh, power and, uh, and the good of journalism for the first time. I'm the guy in the cowboy hat. I'm the guy from Montreal, but I got the cowboy hat, which was pretty good. These are a group of farmers, uh, Rudy Yerke putting the feather in my cap, and uh, Ron Rackham and Rudy's son. Uh, this is uh, from uh, 30 years ago or so. And they're giving me the feather in the cap because um, uh, because uh, of a story that I'd done showing that the city of Lloydminster was, uh, despite saying it was not, was dumping raw sewage on, uh, on farmland. And, uh, and so the farmers uh, liked me better than the mayor. When I left town uh, a, few a number of months later, the mayor uh, said, oh, if I'd known uh, uh, he was leaving, uh, I would have brought rotten tomatoes to throw him at this council meeting. So um, it was a good introduction to uh, uh, to journalism, and uh, I'll come. I'll circle back. I'm mentioning this uh, for a reason, and you know, I did a variety of things in my career, but uh, one of the. Um Interesting things uh, uh, is that the Globe and Mail was um, kind enough to send me to uh, Europe in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and I was a correspondent, and then uh, things began to happen and, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Uh, very interesting for me because that's where uh, my family had come from, and I was in Romania in 1989. Uh, these are um, uh, Nikolai Ceausescu and his wife Eleni Ceausescu. Uh, there was a revolution, and I got to cover that revolution, and what was interesting to me, they were executed, as you see, uh, in the midst of our being there. But what was interesting to me is I'd been there once before uh, uh, reporting, and it was a society that was com civil society completely broken down. People didn't talk to each other. People didn't, um, uh, there was no hot water, so people didn't shower. Uh, uh, people didn't exercise. Everybody was kind of, uh, uh, seemed to be a spy. Every, every third person, they said later, was a securitate agent. Um, but as I was uh, with uh, Reuters correspondent, and I, as we were entering the uh, town where the uh, revolution started called Timisoara, 
uh, uh, there was kind of, it was like sort of uh, uh, the French at, at some point. There are barricades about every hundred yards down the road, manned by, uh, by the community coming together, armed with broomsticks and axes and, and things like that. And there was still fighting going on and uh, there was fighting ahead of us and we couldn't get downtown. So we went home with a young man for the evening named um, Adrian, who um, happened to speak some French and uh, my colleague uh, 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 spoke some Serbo Croatian and we were near uh, the border. And so we were able to communicate and, uh, and find out uh, what life was like. What we were not able to do was file our stories. We'd have to drive by because there was no internet. So we had to drive back. Uh, um, to do that to Belgrade. So, you know, these are a few, if you will, snapshots of, uh, of, uh, of things I've had, to, had the opportunity to do and work with great teams over the years in various places um, uh, at the Globe and Mail and, and do investigative journalism with these teams and champion uh, um, causes like, uh, like same-sex marriage in the early 2000s and, uh, and uh, uh, trying to erase the stigma around uh, mental health and issues like that. So I love journalism and I think journalism is a, is a social good and it's important uh, uh, to have a healthy journalistic uh, world out there. Um, now, it's not always perfect, of course. It's often pretty awful as well, and I think uh, everybody knows that, although the coverage of Brad and Angelina is really ace, I gotta say, that's been good. So um, I'm always comforted by, uh, by what um, the French philosopher writer Albert Camus said. He said, um, and I think this is important when you're uh, thinking that the press is perhaps not worth saving. Uh, to think of. He said, a free press can, of course, be good or bad, but most certainly without freedom, the press will never be anything but bad. I think that's uh, important. Now, of course, a bankrupt press can't be a free and vigorous press, and a press with too few journalists to uh, uh, be working the streets and working the legislatures and working the school boards and working the courthouses and the city halls, et cetera, also uh, can't hold anyone to account and be a, uh, a, a, a vigorous press. We've all seen the deterioration of the institutions of, uh, of, uh, of the traditional media. Uh, newspapers, uh, magazines, um, uh, local television, national television too, uh, radio a little less so, but uh, uh, a lot of radio is uh, where news is a CBC radio and local radio, uh, uh, commercial radio plays less of a part there. So we've seen this, and, and there's a, a group um, that does research around the world called the Reuters Institute uh, at Oxford. And uh, the, in their report last year, they said, across our 26 countries, we see a common picture of job losses, cost cutting, and missed targets as falling print revenues combined with the brutal economics of digital in a perfect storm. And now television news is following uh, the same pattern. So the incumbent media is in decline. And meanwhile, we haven't seen uh, the full development or whether there will be full development of digital media, particularly digital news media, which is uh, what matters for, uh, for our conversation. So very little of it beyond, at the moment, beyond Facebook and Google is profitable. There's very little uh, digital media that's making money. So with that in mind, the Public Policy Forum has set out on a project to try to wrap our arms around what does this changing news environment mean to, um, uh, to democracy? And is there a need at any stage uh, for a public policy intervention? And we started by asking ourselves three questions. Question one is, does the uh, weakening state of traditional media, particularly but not exclusively newspapers, put at risk the civic function of journalism and media, and therefore the health of our democracy? Question two is, if so, are new forms of digitally based media and communications filling the gap, or can they reasonably be expected to fill the gap after a transition period? And question three is, if no, what is the role for public policy in ensuring the healthy flow of news and information deemed vital to our democracy? And what are the least intrusive in ways of designing and delivering these policies? So we are saying policy, and it's important, I think, to think about policy and government, because nobody wants, um, you know, my family came from the Soviet Union, and nobody wants commissars in the newsroom. Uh, uh, nobody wants to cross that kind of line. And in our research, you know, I think Canadians are very concerned about that, uh, that if anything were to occur, that um, the watchdog job of journalism not be compromised by, uh, by some form of direct subsidy into newsrooms. But policies existed for a long time, rightly or wrongly, in this, uh, in this space. 
Um, uh, print publications have uh, received a postal subsidy uh, since before Confederation. It's obviously becoming less relevant in the digital age, but it, uh, it existed for, uh, uh, has existed in one form or another uh, for, uh, for many, many years. Uh, the CBC is an arm of public policy, an instrument of public policy about let's, you know, have a more Canadian media, not only uh, uh, U.S. signals coming over, over the border, and that predates all of us uh, in this room. And, um, and then there's something, you know, just as another example of public policy, in the Income Tax Act, there's something called Section 19, which is um, known to media owners very well and to nobody else because, you know, uh, I'm sure if I asked you to put up your hands uh, how many people uh, have read the Income Tax Act recently, it might be similar to how many people think that uh, this is better for democracy. And, uh, but there is a section that specifically uh, supports, if you will, uh, Canadian-owned media by penalizing non-Canadian-owned media uh, in terms of advertising. So, so policy, and that's been around since 1965, so policy has existed. The question is, is it the right policy? Um, do we want that policy? So we aren't, the public policy forum, uh, interested in advocating for newspapers or advocating uh, for local television or advocating for digital uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we're around to advocate for democracy and then see what paths that takes us uh, down as, uh, as we look at that. Now, why is news different than any other industry? Um, and is it different than other industry? And I go back to um, uh, a Senate report on the news that was done in 1970, a very famous report by Senator Keith Davey. And in it, he says, um, what happens, um, doo -doo. what happens to the catch cats up or roofing tile or widget industry affects us as consumers? What happens to the publishing business affects us as citizens? And I think that's, um, um, well, I think it's true, and I suspect you who are here tonight probably think that's true. There's something different because of the relationship with democracy. Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of the American founders, said, uh, said uh, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. So we're in good company there. Now, right now we're living through the most profound change in media, and perhaps most profound technological change in, uh, in 500 uh, plus years, which is, uh, which is a, long, uh, a long time. And I think the last time we were going through a revolution that was this disruptive and this democratizing at the same time was, uh, was uh, the invention of the printing press. And with the invention of the printing press, comes uh, uh, an attack on the oligopoly who held power in those days, which was mostly uh, uh, the clergy. Today, we probably have an attack on the oligopolists who held power, which mostly uh, journalists like me who had uh, gatekeeping functions and, uh, and could decide what is and what is not news, which, uh, which no longer can happen. In, um, in the case of the printing press, it took about six decades before its great moment occurs, and its great moment is, uh, is Martin Luther nailing his thesis to the doorframe of his church, um, uh, attacking the, uh, um, uh, some of the workings of, of the Catholic Church, and from there, flows the Protestant Reformation, liberal philosophy, capitalism, democracy, free press, a lot of things flow forward from that moment. Now, I don't think anybody knew when it happened that the Martin Luther moment was gonna be a Martin Luther moment that was gonna change history, and I don't think we know if we've had our Luther moment in the digital world, although I sort of suspect not. I suspect we're still too, uh, too early. But all these good things uh, the printing press brought. So I think we have to ask ourselves, those of you who did not raise your hand, whether we're into a democratizing path again that historically might show that, uh, that uh, uh, a much more participatory, participatory world is going to, uh, going to emerge. Now, if, if I go back to Keith Davey, former Senator Keith Davey in his 1970 report, um, of which that's not a copy, but uh, germane uh, in its own way, he said, I think he's the first person to have actually foreseen the power of the internet, although it was completely inadvertent. Uh, uh, he was really uh, being mocking when he, uh, when he wrote this. He wrote uh, that about concentration of media ownership, of course, he wrote, of course it is a bad thing. In a land of bubblegum forests, 
and lollipop trees, he wrote. Every man would have his own newspaper broadcasting station devoted exclusively to programming that man's opinions and perceptions. Now let's leave the lack of gender parity out for, uh, uh, for, for a moment, but that's exactly what we ended up with. We've ended up in a land of bubblegum forests and lollipop trees where every person can have their own opinion and broadcast it, uh, social uh, uh, media it, uh, do a variety of uh, post it, blog it, et cetera, et cetera, and share it with the world and perhaps you know, have their voice rise, uh, um, have it trend, uh, let's say, for Andy Warhol's 15 minutes, or maybe in a more sustainable uh, basis on their YouTube channel, which has now become a big, big, uh, a big hit, let's say. So we live in, we live in a world where I like to say, um, with apologies to Einstein, that E equals MC, and that's everybody is a media company. <laughs> Everybody's a media company. And, and that kind of access we've never seen before, and it's, it's freedom. I mean, it really is an expression of, of freedom, which is a basis of, uh, uh, of obviously our democracy and something that I uh, come to appreciate having my family come from a place that wasn't free and having watched people like my friend Adrian in Romania gain freedom and say, it's amazing, we're having you over eating our food in our house and sleeping on our floor. Um, while, you know, four days ago we would have been arrested for just talking to you on the street. So I believe um, this is a pretty important seminal moment uh, that we have. What, what this new world's not good for, though, is commonweal. It's not good for people sharing similar experiences and, 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 and being cohesive around ideas and debating ideas uh, and being um, challenged by ideas that they may not, uh, may not uh, like very much. So there's some good and there's some bad, I'd say, you know, uh, uh, in this world. And, and I want to give an example of, of each. I think uh, the good example occurred to me when I was speaking uh, uh, at something about uh, three, four years ago. And I was thinking how, um, and it was, it was about foreign reporting. And, uh, and I was thinking how, you know, well, if journalists are not there to bear witness to atrocities and to, and to killing and to battles and, and this sort of thing, um, the world won't know and it'll be, you know, that's terrible to have a world without journalists uh, there to bear witness. And then I thought about the Syrian civil war, which was in uh, uh, kind of its middle uh, intermin uh, interminable stages. And, uh, and there's a city in, in, in Syria called Hama. And Hama has uh, always been a, a city that's uh, um, been offside uh, the, uh, the minority group that, uh, that rules Syria and that's represented by the Assad family. And in 1983, in Hama, um, uh, the Bashar Assad's father, who was then uh, the dictator of, uh, of Syria, um, perpetuated a massacre in that, uh, in that city that went on for about three weeks and tens of thousands of people were killed and no journalists were there to bear witness and, uh, and the world didn't know and the world couldn't react. In 2012, 2011, pardon me, his son Bashar Assad again attacks Hama and again there's no journalist to bear witness but this time the residents of, uh, of, uh, of Hama upload tens of thousands of videos and photos to YouTube and Facebook and Twitter from their mobile phones. And the world does know what's going on. The world may not be capable of coming up with a good coherent answer of what to do about it, but it's not because it doesn't know what's going on. So which is the better world in some ways? Now, on the other hand, and this is much more trite, um, um, my old um, stomping grounds of Lloyd Minster is um, into the E equals MC equation. So uh, two weeks ago, actually, only, uh, the city government of Lloyd Minster decides to go into the publishing business and publish something called the Lloyd Minster Record. And the Lloyd uh, Minster Record is a digital newspaper put out by the municipal government to correct, quote, potentially misleading stories in the traditional media. 
I don't know how that sounds to you, but I want to tell you how it sounds to the uh, city official who was interviewed by a real uh, newspaper person. And I've edited this down a little bit, but uh, it's, uh, it's a terrific uh, um, talk about you know, how certain things can go wrong, I think, in, uh, in this new world, the bad side. Question, by creating your own news outlet, you've come under some fire. Answer, I don't think we've come under fire. I think that there's some interesting debate out there. Question, well, a reporter who used to work at the local newspaper compared you to North Korea. Answer, sure, and you know the beauty of our world is that everybody has that ability to voice their own opinion on any matter. Question, well, that could be constructed as, construed as the media isn't doing the best job they could. We're going to do it for them. Answer, right, and let me reinforce that is 100% not what we're saying. We've got fantastic relationships with local media. That's why they created the Lloydminster Record, of course. Question, historically state-run news outlets are cast in a pretty negative light. You must have thought about that. Answer, absolutely, and again, this is not a state-run news organization. I think when we blur the lines between news and mainstream media, that's where you can conjure up those statements. The fact is news by definition is new information. I, I'm confused at this point. Question, are you the editor? No, there is no editor. It's not a media outlet. It's a news and information site. Question, what's the difference? Answer, mainstream media organizations following certain guidelines. You've got trained journalists behind that that are chasing stories. The difference for us is that we're just providing supplementary and supporting information. So I've got to say, I think he's got it right there, um, uh, that, uh, that you know, they're not following certain guidelines and they're not trained. Oops, sorry. I don't know what this man's doing in Lloydminster. Uh, oh, or this guy. Um, oh, okay, that was when journalism actually was working, I think, in some ways in, uh, in Lloydminster. So I don't think it's very good for democracy that, um, that authorities uh, uh, in the UK, this sort of symptom of syndrome of, uh, of uh, municipal governments, uh, it's uh, called uh, uh, government by Pravda uh, in, the, in the press in UK. And, and I don't think this is a, um, a good expression of the world we're living in. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay. So, uh, so I, I should say for a moment what I think uh, we're serving in democracy and what we're talking about here. And because I think a lot of people conflate democracy and elections. And elections are obviously an expression, you know, probably the highest form of expression of democracy. But you can have a free and fair election and elect uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, you can have a lot of free and fair elections and, uh, and come to conclusions that then suppress democracy. So democracy is obviously much more than free elections. It's also an independent judiciary. It's a, a free press, dare I say it. It's, um, as in the Charter of Rights, the freedom of conscience and religion, the freedom of peaceful assembly, the freedom of association. Section 2B, my favorite section of the Charter of Rights, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication. So this is the function that journalism needs to continue to serve to, to keep democracy, uh, to keep the citizens of a democracy well nourished with information upon which to base uh, their decisions during elections and between elections. And this is the part that, uh, that to some extent, uh, I worry about where we're, uh, where, we're, uh, where we're heading. So we're doing focus groups as part of our research, and in our focus groups, we've heard that um, Canadians expect uh, the furthering of the cause of democracy, but, but oftentimes they have a much more digital view of what constitutes democracy. And that sometimes we say, so you know, what do you mean by democracy? And they say, well, a diversity of voices, many voices. And that's, and that's a very legitimate expression of, uh, of democracy that the old media didn't represent very well in the gatekeeper function. So it's, uh, it, it could be many things uh, there. So while the city of Lloydminster is flooding the media to bring uh, to light uh, its perspectives, and I'm, you know, I'm not crazy, but you know, I suppose that's freedom. Um, John Milton and, Aero Paget and Ariel Pagetica said, uh, you know, let truth and falsehood grapple, and uh, and the better will uh, people will figure it out, and the better will come out on top. And I think it's worth it if you can have people bring to light important matters that the gatekeepers like me in the old media probably weren't attuned to because we were kind of caught in our elite consensus um, too much. And you know, some of my um, uh, more activist friends tell, you know, say that uh, that's how black lives matter 
found its voice. It found its voice uh, through digital long before mainstream media gave it, uh, gave it a chance. And I'll just, for one moment, just touch on, on two other downside effects. And uh, they're expressions that I, uh, that I like and they sort of touch a little bit on what's happening in the US election, et cetera, that, uh, uh, that academics are, are talking about. One they call filter bubbles, the other echo chambers. I think echo chambers are a little bit more um, intuitive uh, for people to, uh, to understand. Uh, um, Fox is an echo chamber. Uh, uh, societies become polarized in some ways and they get reinforced. Uh, Breitbart.com is an echo chamber. But an echo chamber also exists because of the way uh, Facebook works and the way uh, uh, other social media sites work because of their filter bubbles, if you will. And the filter bubbles are essentially that you end up in a bubble filtering out a lot of information yourself by getting information from your friends and people who think like you. But even more so, social media uh, outlets through their algorithms filter out even more because they want you to be happy and they want you to hit like as often as possible. They don't want you to hit, I feel intellectually challenged about that. They want you to hit like. And so, um, and so you end up in, in you know, what people are calling a filter bubble. So the key question to me is now, if the incumbent media world is, uh, is, um, is on the one hand in decline and the new media world, in which Facebook and Google are so powerful, um, is, is on the rise, where does news that matter originate? And, you know, actually doesn't originate on Facebook. Um, and, you know, Facebook will be happy, matter of fact, they'll be more than happy to say we're not in the news business, we're a platform, we're a distributor, we're a common carrier. But, again, in our focus groups, when we ask people where they get news, a lot of them say, well, I get my news from my friends off Facebook. And, uh, and that's fine enough, and then they say, a minute or two later, they kind of reflect a little bit about that, and then they say, well, mostly I get my news off my, uh, from my friends on Facebook. When something's really important is happening, though, I go back to traditional media that I know and journalists with whom I'm familiar because I can trust them better. And there may be a trust problem in journalism, and there's certainly a trust problem, and it's a well-earned trust uh, deficit, but nonetheless, relative to their friends and their acquaintances and the people in their filter bubble, they know that they 5% of the time, 3% of the time, whatever that percentage is, they need to get out of their filter bubble and they want to have the capacity to get out of the filter bubble. They just don't want to pay for it. So uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is a trouble. Uh, so we've looked at the hardest question, I think the most important question, and the hard question because there's very little research on it, although it's so critical, and I can't understand why there's so very little research. I think we'll recommend a lot more research uh, on this. And that's, where does news originate, actually, in Facebook and, and on Google News and, and everywhere? How do you know the things that are important for you to uh, fulfill your own democratic uh, decisions and, and obligations. So the Pew Foundation has done a little bit of work in this in the United States, and, um, and one of the cities they went to was Baltimore. Anybody know what that's from? The it's The Wire. Season five at the Baltimore Sun. Uh, 2010, I think, was season five. Um, uh, maybe 2008, I think 2010. And, um, and this was a, 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 it was 2008 actually, season five. And, and this was a newsroom uh, in collapse in many ways in the real world and certainly uh, in the wire in collapse. Nonetheless, the Pew Foundation was doing its research at that point in Baltimore and it, and it went through the city's media ecosystem very thoroughly for a one week period to try to find out not just where people got their news but where that news originated. And 95% of the news originated in traditional media and most of that traditional media news originated at the Baltimore Sun, as it turns out. They've repeated the uh, research in 2014 in Denver, Colorado, in Macon, Georgia, and in Sioux City, um, and, uh, and the same patterns are, uh, are, are there. So 
how do we finance journalism going forward if we've got a sick, uh, uh, a sick regular media? And in my business, you know, uh, the penetration of newspapers in 1950, which is long before even I was born, uh, was 101.6 newspapers for every 100 people uh, um, circulated. Uh, I'm sorry, for every 100 households uh, circulated. And, um, and in uh, today, it's, uh, it's less than 18. So from 101 to 18, that's a dying industry. A dying industry that didn't even recognize it was dying because population growth kind of masked it uh, for a long time. And advertising sales, fallen 20% year after year after year after year. Uh, so that's not a healthy industry, but nor is the fact that the new digital startups that are going, about 85% of, uh, of, uh, of the digital dollars are going to, uh, to two outfits, uh, Facebook and Google. So how do we finance journalism is a big, uh, is a, a big and important point. And I, I wanna just um, end up on, um, on, you know, first of all, I'm hoping and I think, and I have some confidence that this is a transitional period. I'm just not sure how we best get through this uh, uh, transitional period and, wh and whether it will require some sort of uh, uh, discussion of public policy. But I have seen as I've been t going through this that there's essentially two media systems that have um, that are emerging two journalistic systems i don 't by this mean that there 's a uh, print system, if you will, and a digital system i mean there 's two different ways because of the economics and the uh, and the uh, and the structures of these uh, of these um, systems. That, uh, that, that people are, in a sense, gathering news. And of course, I, I say two different, it's more like a Venn diagram, if you will, and there's overlap, certainly, between it. But there are, in a sense, two ways. And I just want to show you a couple of the differences here. Um, so, well, I can see it here, but, uh, so, mostly, system A, which is the classic traditional media system that we've had for most of the last hundred years, is professional journalist system B, which is the more rising system, uh, is more entrepreneurial. System A is, uh, allows boots on the ground. Uh, it has more journalistic intensity, more people in newsrooms, and therefore it could do iterative journalism. The best journalism is not um, somebody saying, Okay, I wonder, uh, you know, elder care is a problem and we should do a story on elder care. That's kind of the uh, known unknown in some way. The best journalism is people on their beats, you know, tripping across stuff. Uh, and I started in a Watergate and, you know, tripping across their beat and, uh, and going, wow, what's this about? It's different than every other day that I see and seeing something there. And that's an iterative process. System B has the strength of co-creation. You can you, the audience, are now producers as well, and you can be partners with the journalists, and that's a great strength. Um, system A is a bit more factually uh, uh, versus opinion tilted. System A is elite control. You know, I say it, even though I'm close to the immigrant experience. Um, uh, and system B is uh, many more diverse voices, so that's better. In system A, you've got libel lawyers, you've got libel insurance. Um, it means that you can have the support to do investigation. I'm gonna come back to this point uh, in a moment. System B, you're flying by the seat of your pants. I know a couple of small sites in Canada have done pieces recently that are not terribly aggressive but have offended some people who are bigger than they are and they're being sued and they're gonna be sued out of existence. Uh, uh, not because they'll ever lose these lawsuits necessarily, because they just don't have the money to fight them. Um, Bundles on the verticals. System A is more about geography and communities of place, and uh, System B is more uh, uh, communities of interest. And uh, politically, we tend to be organized around place more, so uh, that matters for civic function. Um, scarcity and abundance is, uh, uh, I, I, I would skip over it, but you'll wonder what uh, I mean. And it's just that uh, in a newspaper and television, there's a scarcity. You have only so many pages, you have only so much time, and therefore the unit value of a piece of advertising is higher. In digital, it's infinite. And therefore, every unit value of advertising is lower, and that's why you can't get the same kind of return, and it's not uh, uh, easily transferable. I talked about common will freedom. 
So system A does the Rob Ford story in the Toronto Star, and system B does the Rob story on uh, Rob Ford story in Gawker. And this is uh, uh, the point that I'm going to end on, and then uh, uh, we'll be open for some questions. So. Rob Ford leaves us an interesting uh, uh, legacy in this regard. Um, oops, Rob has uh, left my, uh, um, my deck. Um, so as you may or may not recall, the Rob story, uh, Ford story starts on a, on, a, on a night where Gawker breaks uh, the story of the, uh, of the video around uh, the, uh, the crack cocaine video. And the Toronto Star, which has been working on this for weeks but hasn't published, immediately words in catch-up mode, and by the end of the evening, they've done their story too. And the difference between the two has been that the Toronto Star has been constrained by Canadian uh, uh, defamation libel laws and isn't is trying to figure out how they can get the story out. But Gawker is operating out of the United States where they're not going to be sued and under the First Amendment, uh, which provides much greater protection. So a lot of people are very critical about, uh, of the star for having not been more aggressive in acting on the story. I wouldn't be among those people myself. Uh, um, then Gawker goes home and the star sticks with the story. Gawker is, doesn't have a flag, a flag planted in Canada. That's kind of like a funny story for them in a way. Uh, it's not a matter of civic engagement of, uh, of accountability of anything like that. The Star does a couple hundred more stories over the next two, three years. Between 45 and 60 of these stories, I think it'd be said to advance the entire uh, uh, matter or important stories. All these stories are very carefully lawyered and the Star is never sued. Although I must say for people who think that the Toronto Star made money off the Rob Ford story, au contraire, they lost a lot of circulation among people who uh, buy them for their hockey but didn't like their, uh, their Rob Ford. They lost advertisers. This cost them a lot of, uh, a lot of money to stick with this story. So Gawker contri contributes nothing more to the civic function of journalism, of uh, the, civic, the de democratic function of journalism in Canada. It was just visiting and an expression applied uh, several years ago. And um, just like BuzzFeed, which in 2015 set up a bureau in Ottawa and then in 2016 decided it's uh, not worth it. Now today, funnily enough, or not funnily, Gawker is bankrupt, has nothing to do with Rob Ford. It has everything to do with its failure to import the values of system A into system B, such as libel lawyers, insurance, uh, taking care, verification, and so they trip up on a Hulk Hogan video. Do you really want a news organization to die because of Hulk, Vogue, uh, Hulk uh, Hogan? It shows a certain uh, uh, need for system B to bring the best of system A into the best of system B, which is a much more democratic, open system, but is not uh, disciplined or professionalized yet. And that, I think, is the core of what we're trying to figure out in a way. How do you get the good values of System A into the better world of System B? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. And um, uh, I think Kevin's going to come up uh, and uh, if you have any questions, and I'd be happy to answer them. I thank you so much for your attention.
Ed's talk. Um, I also would ask you to come to the microphone to ask your questions. So one, Ed can hear them and uh, everyone else can hear them, including our, our live stream audience. So it is important you come to the, uh, the microphone to ask those questions. When we're approaching the end, I'll give you a little signal. We've got a couple of questions left, so you know that you haven't got much time left if you haven't had your question yet. And uh, when we get to our uh, last question, I'll signal it also. So, without uh, further ado, then I would uh, invite anyone who would like to ask questions in the microphone. Is it a lot? Yes, it is. Good. Class. Thanks, that was great. I was expecting a, a fantastic summary of the description of current state of theory. Um, by way of question, uh, I'm curious about the philanthropy and donor uh, dimension of the possible future of a way of getting system A into system B. Right. Well, thank you for that. Um, uh, so, as um, as you probably know uh, from the question, in the United States, uh, uh, as an example, there's a lot of um, uh, investigative journalism, community-based journalism, other forms of journalism that are now being supported by foundations, uh, by, uh, by philanthropy, and this is uh, much less developed in Canada. Uh, and, um, and there's uh, probably uh, both economic and, uh, and um, legal reasons uh, for that, both. Um, one, uh, we don't have um, the same intensity of billionaires who've uh, set up uh, the Ford Foundations and the Rockefeller Foundations, the Pew Foundations and uh, the Knight Foundations and things like that in Canada. And the ones that we have aren't as wealthy as the ones in the United States. So that's uh, um, always the Canadian problem. There's not uh, uh, quite as much money to uh, go around for the same kind of need. But beyond that, um, uh, the... Um, the foundations uh, themselves, the community of foundations, are interested in, uh, in, in pursuing uh, support for journalism, which I'm just going to say will raise another problem. But they're intimidated uh, by both the way that uh, the Income Tax Act is written vis-a-vis -vis charities, um, the common law interpretations of that, and most particularly the way that the Canadian Revenue Agency has interpreted um, uh, uh, this over the years, and particularly in recent years uh, during the, uh, um, coincidentally or not coincidentally, with the audits that were done uh, of charities during the, uh, during the Harper government years. So, uh, so we will delve into this question in our report and look at, you know, we are, we are examining um, uh, what that might look like if you wanted to uh, make a, uh, a safer, more secure environment for foundations uh, to do this sort of thing. And, and thus, I try to make the difference as well between policy and government in a way, because there's other uh, forms of policy that will make a difference. There's also some challenges uh, uh, with that kind of model, and one of the challenges is um, that if, if a given foundation has, uh, has its own cause, and it may be a very good cause, it may be uh, uh, a cause uh, to fight child poverty, uh, let's say, and, uh, and, you know, it's another form of branded content in a way. It's not really, it's another form of, of, of a, some kind of incursion uh, possibly on the, on the independence of, uh, of the newsroom. You better not irritate these people. They're almost like advertisers. They happen to be um, uh, more publicly spirited, but it's, it's just another complexity that, that I think the foundations are gonna have to spend a lot more time thinking about because they may get st some stories that they don't like. And I have an online. I have an online question. Oh, sorry. Can you say more about system A being fact-based and system B being opinion-based? Is it really a difference in content or method, or is it a difference in how these systems are perceived? Okay, I think uh, it's, a, it's a great question, and uh, I think it's... Um, I think it's cultural and I think it's structural, the differences uh, uh, that I'm describing between the two, and I hope that it's not um, uh, insurmountable, and I don't think it is insurmountable, but, 
But by cultural, I mean, uh, you know, for 100 years, newspapers and then uh, broadcast less so, because in broadcast there's been a lot of rip and read, if you like, but nonetheless, a lot of original journalism done by broadcasters uh, too. They've built newsrooms, and they've built newsrooms um, with a lot of people, and what they're about every day is producing news and, uh, and, and running with the story culturally and saying, well, is that story going to grow? Uh, I was um, both the auto bureau chief of the Globe and an editor while, when we did stories on the sponsorship scandal. And, you know, that story was going nowhere for about two years. You know, but we knew that there was something there and something was going to happen. I can think of other stories that we worked on, and that's why I talk about journalism being iterative. So that's part of the culture, if you will, of newsrooms, but also the economics of them are that most of the resources are put into having journalists and having beats and having specialization. Now, this is breaking down as we speak because they're economics, but that's where the culture's been. Facts are very expensive to ascertain, to, uh, to dig out and to find. Digital structural problem is, uh, as I said, but that a unit, uh, that the value of a unit of advertising is so much lower than it has been historically for printer broadcast, and it falls every year because rather than 5 billion potential impressions, you have 8 billion and then 12 billion and 44 billion potential impressions. So each one has less value. And then the digital operators need to scale up massively to try to make any money off an advertising model. We can talk about subscription models as well. And they really can't afford boots on the ground. They all tend to be small operations that are, that are doing, you know, making some good contributions, but to stick with a story over a year, over two years to grow with it, it's hard. So opinion is, uh, is valuable. Perspective is valuable and it lends itself to that world. It's just harder, I think, in that world to finance journalism. That's what I mean by it. Back to the microphone. Sir. Yeah, hi. Al Chaddock, um, part of the Johan Initiative with John Wilson Saul and uh, Adrian Clarkson and Michael Bodry. And uh, we formed ourselves to bring back into our discourse the important seminal thinking of. Joseph Allen, the people of his time, and uh, its role was played in the development of Western culture. And of course, it was in this town that this happened. Um, I once asked, I've been a journalist and artist and done a lot of things. Uh, I once asked some people, uh, well, I helped form a press club for one thing. And one night I said, So, how come you guys never put stories on the front page about what the hell we're doing to the forests of Atlanta, Canada? I'm sorry, about what the hell? What the hell are we doing? Why aren't you putting any stories on your front page about what we're doing to the forests of Nova Scotia and Brunswick and Bihar Newfoundland? We're seeing it all murdered. The environment's being destroyed. And my friend quite candidly said, well, you know, I'm in the printed press business. We like cheap newsprint. We're not going to challenge them and have the price go up because we want it done more responsibly. In that light, Why doesn't big business, which is also big media, do more stories on the completely negative effect big corporate media business is having on democracy and the education levels of our people and their ability to debate and discuss even the most civil issues? We're becoming a tower of battle all over again, and democracy is not going to live in cities of battle. Population that we created the, the country with were little pockets of two and three thousand people all across the land. That's why the Senate seats and the, the uh, electoral seats are all distributed the way they are. Now we have the vast majority of our people living in cities. We haven't readjusted the electoral system. Uh, this isn't being reported on. This is critical. We have to reform this country to make it work right. We have to educate for the modern era. We're not doing it. We don't teach history. We don't teach civics. We're not teaching debating, we're not teaching philosophy, and we're allowing media to turn news in a democracy into entertainment, another opiate, a drug, instead of something that wakes us up and causes us to unite in action and in common cause. It's creating towers of loneliness all over this map. And we are not doing it. It's certainly sloppy enough, but I think, I think the, the so question is I'd like to the respond to these thoughts because I can see you're listening to me. And uh, I see that you're also a founder of some 
digital media enterprise. And I know, and you know, it's all about where the hell are we going to find money to do anything? How are we going to have anyone on the ground to cover anything and dig up any information at all? How are we going to keep literacy level alive enough that we can communicate sophisticated ideas? Because you can't do it with this new kind of language we're using with these little handheld devices. So uh, we're in pretty muddy water here. You asked early before sure, we sir, started. Sir, sir, the question, though, I think yeah, the, the question, question is. is the question. The question is, you wanted us to say if we thought this was going to help or hurt democracy. I've had a question I still don't know, so I'd like you to go into it a little bit more. If we thought digitalization was going to hurt or help democracy, I couldn't decide one way or the other. I still can't. Well, it's a... Uh, so please enlighten us a little more, please. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll ask the question. Uh, why don't for a moment, if you'll indulge me, I'll ask the question I asked at the beginning, if you think it's uh, better or worse for democracy, the path that we're on. So let me just ask the same question and see if I get the same kind of response that I had earlier. So is the uh, path that, uh, that the media is on, the change in the pay, uh, that we're on, who thinks it's better for democracy? Okay, and who thinks it's worse for democracy? Okay, so you've got um, uh, a lot of allies and the digitalization is not, uh, is not uh, good for democracy, but your argument would be that the old media hasn't ha been particularly good for it either. Um, I don't know how I would vote on it. I still don't know how I feel about it. Well, I, 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 not my place to tell you how you're gonna vote. My place to, give, my place to lay out you know, some arguments to, that you can think about and, uh, and uh, the kinds of things that I'm trying to weigh myself as I'm going forward and figuring you know, if there's a public policy response. You know, I think in implicit, uh, well, you know, uh, more than uh, explicit in your, in your question uh, and tied together is, you know, issues around the education system, literacy, um, democracy, media, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that could bring me quickly to Donald Trump, I suppose, if, uh, if, uh, if I wanted to go there. And, and I think that, you know, I think that if you look at maybe three drivers of, uh, of, of Donald Trump, and I'm outside of talking about the media in some ways here, although they're one of the three drivers, um, you know, I would look at a system, an economic system that's been unresponsive and unfair to a lot of people who have a legitimate, uh, a legitimate grievance. I'd look at an education, an education system that similarly failed them, and if you look at educational scores in the United States, and you see how um, skewed they are by, by income factors, um, uh, you can see that well, as well. So you then have a, an electorate that I don't think is, uh, is um, well educated to, to figure their way through uh, these kinds of issues. And then you have the kind of filter bubble echo chamber effect that I was talking about earlier, where in any case, you're just hearing what reinforces uh, your viewpoint and different, you know, some people are reading the New York Times and they're not Trump voters. And some people are, are on Breitbart, uh, Breitbart.com or, uh, or Fox and they're not Clinton voters. And that's not a good, world for democracy that people are living in those silos and uh, in that way and uh, and you know that's a real problem I could just share that with you well, I have another online question for you Ed. yeah I've got another online, I saw your filter bubble point because you picked up filter <laughs> and I got a filter bubble question uh oh how do we get out of the echo chamber and filter bubble what can we do oh my goodness <laughs> you think it was going to be easier today, didn't it? yeah well you know I think I think there's um, you know there's one thing we can you know start by doing I suppose and that's by understanding and making transparent algorithms because uh, these are very mysterious and uh, and you know Kevin and I were in a session today when we were hearing a little bit about uh, how algorithms affect a particular new, uh, news organization. Um, and you know, I didn't realize that algorithms were designed in a way to keep me away from certain things and, and towards certain things. I realized that I get advertising that's, uh, uh, that's targeted to me. I, uh, because, I, um, because I Googled the Baltimore Sun a couple of days ago and to find out about what year the wire did the, <laughs> the Baltimore Sun, I'm now getting like all kinds of offers for cheap travel to Baltimore and other kinds of uh, things like that. That part of the world I realized, I've seen it happening for a long time, but that even what's on my Facebook feed is different 
than what I just think that it's just my friends uh, uh, and it's kind of neutral. It's not neutral. It's in an algorithm, and uh, and the same thing you know is happening in many ways all over. But so, so I think I think making it transparent so you can understand those uh, things as as citizens who are affected by them and the biases that they're built into uh, them. They're editors. You know, they just happen to be uh, um, robotic. Uh, um, programmatic rather than uh, rather than otherwise. Um, I don't know. I think beyond that, it's probably the duty of every individual and the education system to make people media more media literate, and to um, and the duty of people to challenge themselves to find information that uh, challenges themselves to go outside of their community. And and I think it's our duty somehow or another to figure out that you know in Canada, common wheel, as I was describing, is much stronger still. I think than it is in the United States. The echo chambers aren't as powerful, and uh, and I need to think that issue through a lot more as we're moving toward the uh, toward a conclusion. But I'm I'm not too sure that we're going to solve it ourselves. Back to Hello. In your travels and in your work, I wonder if you've seen or been intrigued by any emerging revenue models that may sustain the system A. I don't know if you've seen anything you're sort of intrigued by. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, one that we're paying uh, a lot of attention to, uh, uh, particularly on the digital innovation side, if you will. You know, if you're in the newspaper business, uh, and I'll talk about one or two models uh, for a moment, but if you're in the newspaper business, start with 60% of your costs are, uh, are in printing, buying paper, printing it, and, uh, and delivering it to people. So if you removed uh, uh, that 60% of your costs, and I won't even get into the environmental, uh, I'm not going to the forest right now, if that's okay with you. Um, uh, you know, even eliminating that, just your real hard costs of it. Um, people talk about content is king in the newspaper business, but in fact, only about 15% of, uh, of what newspapers spend goes to creating content. And at that, it's the most intense content creator of any, of any media form that, uh, that we know. So one model that's uh, intriguing in some ways, La Presse in Montreal, and I mean intriguing on a global scale, I don't just mean intriguing uh, in a Canadian scale. La Presse in Montreal uh, set out a strategy about six or seven years ago, and they have uh, not deviated from the strategy, which is not true of anybody else who in six or seven years will have uh, deviated from their strategy um, three to 10 times probably, because it's hard for people to stick to strategies among so much uncertainty and so much change. And what La Presse decided is that they were gonna go on the tablet shortly after the tablet came out. And uh, I believe in their early thinking, they thought they would buy everybody a tablet, but they didn't have to do that and in the end. They didn't have to have that cost. And that they would slowly, so they, they spent about three, four years building up a beautiful app and, and figuring out how to get advertising on that app and how to present it in a way that would work and how to make news work on that app and training their, uh, their staff and their newsroom and having intense strategic uh, uh, focus on this. And then in, I can't quite remember, I think it's 2014, but I may be off by a year, they decided to, they, they had decided this years earlier, but they said they were gonna stop printing the paper Monday to Friday. And if people wanted to stay with them, they would have to go onto the app, which would be a free app, supported by, um, by advertising. And they'd move their advertisers and their readers over. And their numbers are amazing. Um, uh, the numbers of people they've moved over are amazing. The amount of time they spend with it, which is over 30 minutes a day, Monday to Friday, and over 60 minutes a day on the weekend, which are very similar numbers to the best of, uh, of newspapers. Uh, and, and this is on the app. And, the, and, and part of the reason they decided the app is the app is a um, environment in which you can keep people and capture. There's no back button out of the app, so it's not easy to go in and out. Once you're in, you can go out, of course, but once you're in, you then see something else you like and something else you like, and, uh, and if it's really done and executed well, it's very, uh, it works well. Uh, they've also done something that almost nobody else has done, which is lower their average age uh, uh, per, uh, per reader. And you know, there's the killer for you. You can do a lot of things, but if your reader, average age of reader is gonna be in the high 50s and the low 60s, um, you're on a path to doom in any case. So they've managed to start lowering uh, uh, that uh, on, uh, on their app. So that's a very interesting model. Uh, the Toronto Star uh, followed the same model called Star Touch, and it hasn't worked very well. 
Now, is that because uh, La Presse is in a less competitive environment and a more enclosed environment and, uh, uh, by the French language? Well, they'd say not. They say, you know, with many people using Facebook and Google, and there's four newspapers in Montreal, and that they're, you know, uh, Quebec Corps is very strong and uh, the CBC is very strong uh, uh, in Quebec. So they would say, no, that's not it, but other people think that might be it. Is it an execution differences? I don't know. But it's one of the models uh, that I like. I've seen a lot of little upstarts that are doing things in more isolated um, uh, jurisdictions, smaller jurisdictions in northern Ontario and Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, places like that. And they're starting to hire journalists to support this. So they're moving up. Um, the classic disruption chain where the disruptor is lower quality always and then you know the bad awful Toyotas and then they start year by year by year getting be good and better and that's a kind of classic model and I think I'm starting to see some of that. I'm not sure how, uh, how it comes into more competitive markets given you know, the fragmentation, low barriers to entry and the low unit costs of, uh, of advertising and the difficulty of getting people to pay for subscriptions. But I don't have to really figure it out. Somebody smarter than me is going to figure it out, and they may figure it out accidentally, too. But you do see some green shoots, yes. Sir, may I ask, sir, what you think we should do in Halifax about the Chronicle Heritage? The reason I ask is it was a system A. It all seems to have migrated to New Brunswick and is done by telephone. We have elements of system B. I'm sorry, elements of? System B, okay. a uh, alternate press, but not very strong. What can an individual do? My subscription ran out. I haven't renewed it. I'm told I shouldn't even read it. It's not appropriate to read it because it's put out by strike breakers. But it, I miss it. And we all miss it, I think, in Halifax. And I wonder what you think, as residents of Halifax, we can do to get those two sides to reach an agreement. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, okay, this has been going on for eight months and I'm going to, I got, I'll take eight seconds and uh, um, look, I, I, I mean, you know, the short answer is I don't know. Newspaper strikes have been uh, uh, horrible things, uh, you know, even before we were in a period of change like we're in. The Montreal Star went on strike in uh, 1977, I think, and then uh, folded a couple of years later. Um, uh, the Ottawa Journal went on strike and never came off strike, and it folded in uh, 1980, uh, while people have been on strike, I think, for two years or something. Um, so it's difficult to, uh, uh, to sort of see, you know, between the will of the owner who's putting out a product that, you know, I don't read it every day, you read it, I'm inferring from what you're saying that it's certainly not as good a product as it was and not contributing to the community in the same way that it did, uh, I think, would that be a fair uh, summation? Um, you know, that should create an opening for other people, if that's right, to, to start up something that would have a stronger economic base, a disruptive economic base online, and I take it the strikers have uh, tried to do that themselves, but I don't think it's uh, um, uh, attracted the audiences that, uh, that the Chronicle Herald has been attracting uh, historically. So I guess for whatever reason, whether it's marketing or quality or whatever it is, it's, uh, it's not doing the job. I don't know how you bring them together, but it's, it's actually a question for, uh, for your mayor and your members of the legislature and your members of parliament from here too, because if the democracy isn't as vibrant, they probably have a strong interest in banging heads together and trying to bring it to, uh, to some form of resolution. There is a public interest in good news organizations within communities. They are part of the public good, the public health of the community, and therefore, um, I think I'd ask people who actually reside here and represent here and uh, have some responsibilities for, uh, uh, for making this a good, healthy, vibrant community. We have two, time for two last questions. Uh, one of them is going to be online, and then we will give you the last uh, question. Uh, from the online uh, community, then, Ed, should we as citizens have to pay for news? <coughs> Long sip of water. Um, yeah, I think that would be good. <laughs> uh, 
I don't think that it's, you know, nobody is obligated to do anything. You're not obligated to go vote, but it's better if you go vote. Um, you're not obligated to pay for news, but it's better if you pay for news. I think in the focus groups that I was referring to, uh, it was interesting. Some people said, you know, I, I, do, I do pay for one site because I just want to have, you know, something that I'll need to have. You know, when I need it, uh, you know, it will be there. Some people said, other people can pay for it and I'll be a free rider. Maybe it's a tragedy of a commons kind of uh, economic, uh, economic problem here in some ways. Um, Somebody's got to pay for news, if you believe in news. And uh, so who are the somebodies? Who are the, uh, the suspects, right? They are um, certainly the consumer in the marketplace. Um, they are, uh, to some extent, that it may be uh, billionaires who are uh, motivated for good reasons or motivated for bad reasons. And we've seen, uh, we've seen both. In Canada, we have two billionaire families who've supported uh, uh, newspapers, I think, uh, for the good of the country, the Thompson family and the Globe and Mail and the Detmarat family and La Presse. Um, in the United States, we've seen in Boston, John Henry, a billionaire by the Boston Globe. Uh, and we've seen Jeff Bezos, um, not just by the Washington Post, but bring his Amazon brain and his Amazon team to try to solve the problem, you know, through the Washington Post. Then again, we've seen Sheldon Adelson, uh, a billionaire casino owner in Las Vegas, buy the Las Vegas paper and try to use it to go after his uh, political enemies. So, you know, that's a kind of pretty double-edged uh, uh, sword. Philanthropy, uh, as we talked about, might be, uh, might be a source uh, uh, for supporting news. The public purse might be a source. You know, the CBC got another $125 million a year, I think it is, uh, over five years in, uh, in the last budget. Um, I think making sure the CBC spends that money well is, is important. And, you know, some people might think uh, the BBC uh, in Britain has been mandated to, um, um, well, I, I'm not sure they've mandated. I think they may have chosen to do this rather than get themselves in a position to be mandated. But they are supporting local news uh, gathering in, uh, in communities across uh, Britain and, uh, and basically open sourcing their local news in a way, which is, uh, which is a thought. It'd be great if, uh, if um, you know, people believe in, uh, uh, in the importance of news, if they uh, if they help finance it, that would be good. After that, I'm running out of options, right? Okay, last question, please. So, the question I have concerns the way that you describe the Canadian Press and the way that you describe System A. Insofar as I think of one feature that's not there, which really has to do with System A as a rule bound. I don't know all of the rules of journalism, but as somebody who reads the paper, one of the things you typically see is that every story has to have a for and against. There's always two sides to the story. So when we hear or read, for example, about climate change, we would have to hear not only about the scientists who tell us that this is real, we also have to hear about people who are going to tell us that this is not real. And often the way it gets presented is that it's a 50-50 kind of debate. We don't really know who's right about this. I mean, that's one kind of a caricature, but it seems to me that you know, it's in terms of my own perceptions and conversations with journalists, there's a bunch of rules they learn in order to be journalists. And I'm curious as to what you think is happening in System B. Um, is it that in System B there are no rules? Is it that there are rules and they're just not transparent to us? Is it that these are rules that are going to evolve over time and we just don't know what they are? Um, it certainly doesn't seem to be that they've got the same rules of uh, System A. So I'm just curious as to what you think is happening or going to happen in System B. Um, well, let me start with System A in the answer, if that's okay. You know, I think the System A rules, uh, uh, you know, are breaking down in many ways in any case. And, uh, and you see um, more point of view uh, entering into, uh, into journalism uh, generally. I think also that I, I wouldn't characterize, um, I understand why you characterize it as, you know, kind of the he said, she said, uh, um, kind of journalism, but but I think that's um, uh, you know kind of journalism when it's being particularly weak. Uh, I don't think uh, um, I don't th and when there's not really consensus around issues and and probably probably uh, journalism lags when the consensus gets formed. I think classically, and I I, I, I know a little bit about this because I did my graduate thesis on it. You know when the press around the Vietnam War um, begins to uh, move out of the consensus that the war is winnable and things are doing well, and that happens in the 1967-68 time period, it coincides with the political consensus also 
but uh, in favor of the war breaking down, um, particularly around the Tet, uh, Tet Offensive. And, and so I think in a sense, you know, journalism isn't um, um, courageous, classic system A journalism isn't courageous in that way. It's, it's, as I say, part of the elite accommodation consensus in many ways, which makes system B, in some aspects, much more interesting. Um, uh, a free marketplace of ideas, a place where ideas that can't actually break into system A that can, you know, get voice and, uh, and can go much deeper with greater expertise into subjects like, uh, like the science around climate change, uh, let's say, and influence uh, old media by doing that and by finding, uh, finding an audience. So I'm not sure if, uh, I, I somehow or another feel that I, I, I don't wanna like answer the last question poorly, Kevin, but I feel like I'm going to uh, answer the last question uh, poorly. System B, uh, nonetheless, needs to have discipline and boots on the ground around it. If it doesn't have reporting, and and if it doesn't have the ability to finance reporting that is going to irritate people by having lawyers and by having libel insurance and by um, verifying facts and doing those kinds of things, then it's not going to contribute uh, as much as it should and could to, uh, to civic function of journalism. On behalf of SESEP and the McKechnie Institute of uh, Public Policy and Governance, please join me in thanking Ed Greenspan for a great uh, discussion tonight. Okay. quite convoluted and complex and incomprehensible. And uh, while I still think that may be the case, uh, I think you've actually brought quite a bit of clarity uh, in your discussion tonight and in the roundtable we had earlier today to clarify, and I, I think to help us to think about the separate streams and the sort of paradox that one isn't necessarily overtaking another, perhaps they're, they're coexisting in what's emerging or will emerge in uh, something you describe as perhaps a, a revolutionary state uh, will be will be something all the, the much more uh, uh, engaging uh, that will hopefully strengthen our democratic institutions and also provide uh, an opportunity for a better informed public. Um, I know that the work of the Public Policy Forum is very interesting in this area and that we're looking forward to the work that you're doing and the results you'll produce uh, for guidance around what might be appropriate public policy interventions for government in this area and how indeed we can strengthen our democratic institutions and provide more informed uh, debate in our, among our citizenry. Uh, so I couldn't help but think this report the Public Policy Forum will produce will be uh, Ed's doctrine that you'll be nailing on the church door at the end of this. And so we look forward to the results of this study and uh, the public policy recommendations that are pursued uh, thereafter. I'd, uh, I'd like to thank the audience here tonight for your thoughtful questions, your respectful questions. I'd like to thank the uh, online community that joined us and also provided us some very good questions. I would like to encourage you to fill out the evaluations that are on the desk in front of you because I know that SESEPA likes to receive the feedback so we can make these events even more engaging and more helpful uh, for you uh, next time.